process very heartily now. Yes, if I could just get comfortable with my hemorrhoid cushion. <clears throat> what do you mean? Speaking of squeaky clean buttholes, how the hell are you, Clay? I'm good. How are you, my friend? Not bad, not bad. So uh, this is another special episode of Bits and Chunks, and I figured I wanted to get you, I wanted to tap our brains regarding not only the newest uh, iteration of Mad Max Furiosa, uh, yes. but uh, our, our take on the whole series. You know, this may be go a little bit longer than what we usually do, but um, this is been one of my favorite things to watch and uh, be a part in as far as the, the subculture and I just wanted to say hey let's let's talk about this since Furiosa is kind of hot right now and and so yeah with that said guys I'm Jason that's I'm Clay it's Clay that's me and we are cinematic suffering that's us we do horror movies and in this case uh it might be a slight extension but there's some definitely some horror elements in the Mad Max uh pantheon but to me it fits in uh perfectly with the uh tapestry of movies that we enjoy anyway mad max uh was definitely part of that whole uh cinematic push that we were very fortunate to be young men when a lot of that stuff was unfolding um those yeah. kind of what would you call them like grindhouse movies basically is is where yeah. the mad max series originally started I think yeah the 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 Australian uh, it was a low budget it started off as a low budget Australian kind of grindhouse art film in a way um but let's uh what was I going to do oh I was going to say uh, guys if you're watching this on YouTube go ahead hit that like that like button uh, also uh, if you have a, a comment about the Mad Max movies at all including up to Fury so just leave us a comment below we'd love to hear your thoughts too um and I will go in and separate the segments out on YouTube so you can see our little intro. And if you want to just jump in straight to Furiosa, which I think we'll probably be hitting last if we're going in chronological order here, uh, you can always jump ahead. Uh, but yeah, let's let's start off with the intro a little bit more. Uh, yeah. I wanted to pick your brain on how you first discovered uh, Mad Max. Which film did you see? How did you find it? And yeah. I think I was kind of, in a way, I was a little bit uh, late to the series because I heard about uh, the original Mad Max in hindsight. Uh, my brother, my older brothers told me about it. It came out, I believe, 1979. I didn't yeah. take any real rigorous notes, but that the original came out in 1979. I would have only been five years old, so I was a little bit young for that one. Yeah. Uh, the Road Warrior is the first one that really captured my imagination. That was uh, a movie that was very popular in the HBO era. That was... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for <laughs> for any of you youngins in the crowd who can't relate, uh, cable TV was the way that we, you know, kind of watched a lot of these these movies back then. And HBO would put that one on, as I recall, on pretty regular rotation. Yeah. The I, I always looked at the Road Warrior as kind of the Evil Dead Two of the series. It was a it, it was a sequel in in name and spirit but it was also kind of a retelling with a much bigger budget and and a lot more cultural relevance than the uh, original first film which was uh, beautiful in its way it was really um you know kind of uh, rough and and rough around the edges it only had a cat like a cast and crew of 30 people like yeah. the when the credits rolled there's about 30 people involved in that movie which is pretty amazing yeah um but I, I always love movies like that that kind of birthed out of just a just raw creativity and and, and young, youthful uh, enthusiasm, sure. and that's that's kind of how Mad Max came about. Road Warrior was the one that 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 first really captured my attention. Yeah, uh, I would say the the Road Warrior was definitely the one that caught my attention, and uh, and I remember I didn't have HBO back when I was growing up, but. You know, I did go to the video store a lot and I would go to the video store and my dad would, you know, take me if I'd stayed with my dad's, especially he would uh, take me to the video store. And one of the, I remember seeing the Road Warrior on, you know, one of those clamshell video cassette uh, yeah. cases sitting on the shelf. And I was looking at it and it's just it was just like that bare bones. Maybe I'll pop up the put a graphic on the screen later. Um, but it's where Mel Gibson's just kind of standing there in the middle of the road with the, this gun. He looks ragged as hell. Maybe I think his dog is next to him. But it, that's the still and had just the road warrior on it. And yeah. 
and uh, and that intrigued me because I was like, "What is this? This is like." And uh, I picked it up, and I, I I remember watching it. And as a young kid, you know, 80, 83 or eighty four is when I f- probably first saw it. Uh, you do, you don't catch some of the nuances that are in the movie, like the like the relationship between Wes and his partner on the bike that got killed. That you you know, I thought it was just. <laughs> You know, as a kid, you don't, you know, you don't see that stuff when you're a kid. So, but I love the action. Um, I probably was a little too young to see it, but my dad didn't care. It kept me occupied. And so I, I would, that would be a regular rental at the video store with, was the road warrior. And then I don't know how I, I don't know how I discovered Mad Max only that I think I saw that in the video store as well. And I didn't, I didn't put two and two together because one was called Mad Max and the other was, was called the road warrior. Um, yeah. In Australia, I think it was called Mad Max 2, though. Um, but so I didn't put two and two together until I remember wait, that movie they call him Max and the Road Warrior. I wonder if this is the same. And I watched it, and then that's when I realized this world was created. And then I remember telling my dad, who, who listened with so such total interest in how the <laughs> movies were connected, and this is Max from this movie, and how they, you know, the, his family gets killed in this one, and this is him in the post apocalyptic. Uh, Australia and he's like oh that's great all right we get to see the archetype of the hero dad he starts <laughs> off as this as this pure character and then he's tarnished um yeah. but there's there's definitely a reason that these films have endured so much and they yeah. uh you know they they definitely continue to capture my attention i i looking back i think that i grew to appreciate them more as an adult you almost don't realize what you have yeah. in the moment um it sounds like you appreciated the movies a lot more in the moment than i did i i didn't i liked them uh, you that was know, only definitely... after multiple viewings though but yeah after i got finished watching the road warrior for the fifth or sixth time <laughs> no and kids then, will just repeat yeah yeah, yeah. and so but yeah i i i think uh, i think with the mad max series and i think why it, why it touches on a lot of people and why they're such good movies is that even though this world is a fictional world, it is very works very parallel with the dangers of the modern world that we live in, uh, the dangers of a nuclear annihilation, and maybe even that's not going to be that's not obviously going to kill everyone just right off the bat. That there may be what happens in the movies, these sects and uh, cults and everything starts pulling away into these warlord. You're going back to the Stone Age, pretty much of uh, roving tribes and surviving you know you're just trying to live to you know survive off the land and take what you can from who's ever weakest and it, it really plays a part especially in modern day with with the nuclear threat that still hovers even after the cold war that it could happen again i, I mean not again but it could happen world war yeah. the dreaded world war three and that's that's a dread I think we're all kind of like interested in, but really hope it doesn't happen. But if it well, does happen, it's... maybe it'll be something like Fury Road. <laughs> well, and it's it, it introduces some themes that are so enduring. It's kind of, uh, you know, parallel to zombies and, you know, certain archetypal monsters and horror movies. You see them just the, the, there's always a cultural interest in it. And yeah. we see that a lot with the, the post-apocalypse. It's like, well, uh, you know, there's this almost weird in a weird sense, this optimism that we're going to survive it, that we, the species, right. uh, the hominids are still going to be, uh, you know, uh, scrambling around in this irradiated post-apocalyptic nightmare. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just, I love the way George Miller to this day is, is, able to kind of revisit that world and give us something new to appreciate about right so, I, you know and i know i'm bouncing around a little bit i know we're going to talk about furiosa later but um it, it bums me out that that movie isn't doing as well as at the box office yeah. as it should it was really i think a really a fantastic addition to the series yeah uh 100 agreed and like i said we'll get to that uh yeah eventually but uh so let's go back to 79 now yeah. And let's talk about Mad Max. What when you do you remember when you first saw Mad Max? Uh, do you remember your first impressions? Uh, have you rewatched it again recently? And do you I, have any, uh, other I haven't. 
I haven't rewatched it again recently, honestly. The the most that I've done recently is revisited some of the the old uh, vintage, you know, retro trailers, which I love. They've got the classic grindhouse aesthetic to the trailers, like in the near future. There's one man and they, you know, set up the story and it's got this awesome, uh, you know, kind of lo-fi soundtrack that really right. kind of not only encapsulates the theme of the music or of the of that movie, but it that soundtrack encapsulates 80s uh, pop culture to me. Yeah, the, yeah, the Mad sure. Max score, especially um, the, the intro as the, the as you're going into the 80s. Um, it, it's it's just weird cool natural pro progression of how the music was changing and it still has this kind yeah. of grind housey feel about it but you can see where you know like friday the 13th is going yeah. you know, and all that stuff yeah yeah but definitely definitely but no it's it's been a while since i've revisited the old ones uh, yeah. the old movies uh you know in hindsight we probably should have done it for this podcast <laughs> but uh i would like to go back and watch them all because as i was watching furiosa i was thinking like oh man i could really go for re-watching yeah um you know the the previous mad max movie and then i was thinking like well let's just i should go back to the beginning and just watch all of them in in order um, yeah you know uh the the third one didn't didn't connect with me as much as as it should have even though thinking back there were some just iconic moments in that yeah. third movie also yeah for sure yeah absolutely for sure and you know when i when i think of mad max um i think it, it, you, you kind of I I compare it to because I after watching the Road Warrior as much as I did as a kid and then going and watching Mad Max, the there was a slower pace. To oh the yeah, first one that that I wasn't expecting. Road Warrior had a had a great pacing to it. There's action pretty much throughout, um, but there's some low key kind of dull moments in Mad Max, and I think it's just Miller maybe just trying to find his footing and it's probably had to do with budget budgeting concerns um but he's really building the story of max and how you know i'm not even sure if he was planning on doing a sequel after this maybe he was maybe he wasn't but you know that to the eventual revenge plot uh that we get to in mad max it it, it's, it started picking up and you start seeing the the real horrors of humanity versus humanity in this movie and, and yeah it's it, it, I can go back to it now. It's not my favorite. Uh, I do like Mad Max, the first one, but it's not one I will consistently go back to and watch, though. The the second one is the one that's kind of like, you know, all right, that's that's the one in the series that's uh, kind of almost comfort food by this point because yeah. we've it's been around so long. That's the one that I could probably get get into you could put it on anytime for me it's almost yeah. kind of like i don't know the original star wars or the second star Wars, one of those kind yeah. of like comfort food type of movies oh yeah yeah for sure and uh yeah when i it, it's uh, i love how they they used some things from so let's just jump into the road warrior because i sure um because they they took what they did in mad max and then they just what do they do? They increase the hype uh, like a, a hundred times. So not only is the world finally, because the world was already on the edge of, of burning anyways in Mad Max. So now the world has burned and the road warrior society is completely collapsed. Uh, you see Max and his V8 interceptor, just badass bitching car that I fucking <laughs> just... love. And I, and I'm not a, I'm not a car guy, but I love hearing the rev of this engine, the whine of the, the, the nitrous on it. And it, it just fills me with this weird testosterone feeling that just well, pumps through my. <laughs> it does. It's such car fetishism, and I've never, I've never been into it. But like you say, I, I was thinking the same thing when I was rewatching the original trailers for these original movies. Is that there's just something uh, so visceral. It's, uh, yeah. It, it's you just there's something appealing about the premise of it's okay there's what kind of vehicles would work in the post apocalypse it would have to be all found stuff right. and it, it's an obvious leap for the audience that you know that, that any of this stuff could work for one thing gasoline yeah. like you know okay how in the hell are do we refine <laughs> gasoline right yeah uh, and so the movies it, it's well you strange. have gas town of course Oh yes, you have Gas Town and <laughs> Bullet Town because you need bullets. It's it, in a way, it's a such a, a kind of charming, um, almost almost childlike way that the story kind yeah. of uh, 
<laughs> he kind of gives you these plot elements like well, yeah gas town oh we need water well there's a town that that's got that hoards the water it's like all <laughs> these, these independent baronies right uh, <laughs> you know but yeah uh, i i think with the road warrior i mean yeah i'm thinking the, the it's still in the infancy the world's still in the infancy there are still some of these little refineries around that are still operational and you know people are just trying rushing and getting as much as they can uh, so yeah that that explains like humongous and his uh his gang trying to take over the the, the refinery that these people are trying to hold the classic uh circle the wagons uh while getting attacked from without and just defending it was the it's an alamo kind of situation in a way yeah uh, i i was i took a film i took a film class uh years ago and uh, the teacher said, I want you to take one minute from your favorite movie and I want you to break down how many shots are in that one, that how many cuts and edits are in that, that one minute of film. It's an and interesting exercise. It was a pretty interesting exercise because I took The Road Warrior and I said, I'm going to do the first minute of the, not the first minute of the movie. No, maybe it was the first minute of the movie. At that, at, but, um, so when I came back to the when I when I realized when I was sitting down there was only there was over like sixty shots in one minute of just flashing editing going to the go to the wheels and then to the V eight and then to Mel a close up of Mel and then the, the close up or, or show the back just going you know these crazy great action shots and I'm trying to write everything down and get everything into this shot list and I come back into the class and everyone's bringing in these films like. Oh, I don't know. The end of your day, the end of the affair, or you know, the, the, these old time movies that have just that one, the one long shot. It's like, oh, it was so. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Pirisawa. Christ! Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting there writing down all the shots that George Miller. I guess I could have just, uh, just done the same. But I, I really love the movie so much that I just breaking it down in that one scene was really eye opening. Uh, so it was really cool. Uh, and, well, I, it, I'm sure that it didn't turn into this big film debate in your class, but I would argue that George Miller is just as relevant as all those other movies that, you know, some of the, the students might consider loftier, more artful yeah. films, you know, especially after you listen to some interviews with the man. He really genuinely loves the craft of filmmaking. Yeah. And, um, you know, more importantly, almost the the storytelling, the myth making aspect of it and how we fit into that as people. There's a very yeah. uh, human through line in the Mad Max. And y you saw it a lot in the uh, the the 80s spawned a whole bunch of imitations of tawdry imitations of the Mad Max movies because they were popular. Right. So naturally, uh, oh, wow, all we need is a, des a desolate kind of stretch of desert and a beat up old car and we can make our movie but right yeah. it's obviously it's it, it, there's a reason that the mad max movies have endured and we haven't gotten a thousand sequels of whatever i can't sure. even think of a you know of like one of the b movie knockoffs i'm sure they're pretty entertaining oh they're 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 out there for sure and i, I probably have seen quite a few of them i just can't remember off the top of my head but um yeah these are always enduring the world building is amazing and the the continuity be between the films starts fading a little bit once you enter uh, Beyond Thunderdome. Um, yeah, and uh, like, I, you know, I, I need to rewatch that one as an adult because I feel like as a kid, it, there's there's something that I was missing. But I I watched it over and over, and I liked I like certain elements, but for some reason, um, as a kid, the the it, it never equaled the sum of its parts for me. I don't know if. Yeah. Uh, rest her soul love her to death but tina turner was not did not do it for me as far as as you know kind of a, a an antagonist in that movie it just did, didn't work for me no I, I i totally get that uh i you know i think she did a great job for you know what she did she wasn't doing shakespeare it was a yeah, yeah. On their dome. so but uh and the found the fucking soundtrack was uh fire i mean oh it know, was one of tina turner's best damn songs is <laughs> is the theme song from beyond thunderdome and it's it's like it's about thunderdome and you never thought that her main one of her ba main <laughs> best badass songs would be this goofy ass movie <laughs> <laughs> where she looks fantastic like there's oh, <laughs> it, she's it's already kind of... in her she's in her 40s in this movie 
Oh, already. yeah. Well, I mean, and it's kind of like, OK, that we're in the post-apocalypse where water is a valuable resource. But Tina's up there looking just just phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> but but, you know, I'm talking like uh, there's there's it was kind of uneven with Thunderdome because I, I do I own everything streaming and I, I, I watched Thunderdome maybe about three months ago. It's one of those like you, those guilty pleasures. You just like sitting down and watching it. And no yeah. matter how goofy and bad it may seem, it's still it still has a special place in uh, the lexicon of the films. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, and, and there are certain parts that just like stay with you like um the two men enter one man one leave, man leave. That, that that thing um you know the part where they sent max out into the desert with the the big like yeah. uh you know um what mascot head on there's yeah. certain moments in that that are just so iconic and stick with you but i can't for some reason the movie felt like okay and then this thing happens and then this thing happens like yeah. it just felt like um like a lot of vignettes that never really for me yeah. you know kind of gelled into an overarching story that that felt really compelling but i'm i'm basing this off of my murky memory no 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 you're 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 nailing it 100% uh, that the there's also like inconsistencies in the continuity of the, from the last movie uh, we, we can assume that max is the same character from the last movie which is <laughs> yeah. obvious but the the arrival they reuse the gyro captain from Ro the road warrior in thunderdome and your first thought is oh it's the gyro captain he's back and now he's uh uh, he's going to play this part and mad and max is going to recognize him and really in the whole in, in the story uh, i think even miller says it's not the gyro captain the gyro captain took off in the in the road warrior and helped settle uh, a clan with the people that he left with um so this guy even though he's played by bruce spence the same guy who played the gyro captain and this guy flies as well. He's not the gyro captain. So it's it, very confusing. It's very it's, confusing. It's a very recognizable actor, too. Yeah. You're gonna spot him right away. It's like, yeah, why <laughs> and then there is a there's like this weird moment of recognition where Max runs into him and he's like, you. And then but he's not you because he recognized him. I, I maybe I, some recognition, but you know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah, that that's it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. It's like uh, I don't know. It'd be like casting uh, Harrison Ford as a different character in the Star Wars movies. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. That's exactly it. Like, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then there's a there's the point where the first half of Thunderdome is this kind of like political. It's this political intrigue that's going on within Barter Town, you know, uh, Master Blaster controls the methane production underneath. Uh, and geez, what does she play? <laughs> what does Tina Turner? <laughs> I just say Tina Turner plays. Uh, is this is the uh, is only a ruler maybe in name only because Master Blaster holds the power, the real power. Um, so she kind of manipulates Max and to uh, challenge Master Blaster to a duel and in, in the Thunderdome, and it's real serious. And there's like real complications and uh, cool political entry, like I said. And then from that point, we get in after he gets banished into the desert. Uh, we discover the lost children that are in the desert, and I think that concept in itself is cool. But then it turned into kind of a a cartoon ish kind of a battle. Uh, when because there's bonks and bongs and people uh, when the little guy with the the big thing on his head the bald the bald guy yeah. the small uh, his name's like angry angry Anderson that's his name he's from <laughs> uh, he's from this uh, musical group, rock group in uh, Australia but anyways you hear the little birds after he gets uh, knocked on the head and things like that it starts turning this weird kind of goofiness and at the end you know that that big chase on the the locomotive you know, kind of ends with them escaping, except she leaves Max alone, even though he's stranded there and just kind of ends. And it's just it's, it's just an odd feel, odd type of movie all around. Uh, yeah. And, and I recall, um, you know, because like the, you know, Tina Turner's uh, Thunderdome theme that, that you mentioned, that thing was on constant rotation on MTV yeah. at the time. So 
it's it's kind of odd. It's kind of odd still that those movies had become kind of mainstream fare. And by the time Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome came out, it was that was a mainstream movie. There was a lot of yeah. uh, of kind of mainstream buzz about it. So I, it's just it's weird to think about people potentially bringing their kids to this uh, yeah. what should be kind of this bleak dystopian world, and then like you say, they had odd. Looney Tunes sound effects when yeah. somebody gets clonked on the head, like you could tell they were like, "Don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't be too uh, rough and and violent with it." I I remember my watching that movie with my grandma in the room, and they talked about methane production a lot, and they taught the the words pig shit was uttered a lot. <laughs> and I remember my, my grandma saying, grumbling, being like clucking her tongue and saying, I wish that they, why do they have to say that word? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> grandma, it's a, it's the post-apocalypse. People are eating their you're babies, right. but you're, you're worried about some blue language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure why the, the tone is totally different because I, I don't know, uh, maybe it's because there's two directors, uh, another guy named George o o Ogilvy is credited as helping direct Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome because the writers are essentially the same from Mad Max and uh, The Road Warrior. Um, and so, would, that would explain its kind of dissonant tone. Yeah, uh, the, with the different kind of... It's, it's not totally Helm by George Miller. It's kind of like looks like it's split between. So maybe that explains some of the weird tone it has. Um, overall, I, 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 I always enjoy Thunderdome. The, 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 the music is badass. There's some great action scenes. The notion of oh, two men enter, one man leave, uh, and people repeating that phrase and that, you know, the music. And then the, the, the announcers like, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Yeah. That was a great time here. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And I love those moments and great lines, but and overall that, that, that was shot. Great too. That yeah. Scene. Oh, it was amazing. But overall it's going to be the weakest Definitely, I think it's agreed by everyone. It's probably it is the weakest link of all the films. Yeah, it's definitely not a controversial take to say that that it's that, that that's a meh kind of yeah. one in the series. I, but you know, still appreciated it in a oh, lot yeah. of ways. All right, well, let's uh go ahead and jump ahead. What is it? When did the Thunderdome? Thunderdome came out in '85, so we jump forward what to 2014. <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> jump, and I, I, like it, it's so odd that they've even made more Mad Max movies because it feels like, I don't know, it, well, I guess it'd be like making another Ghostbusters movie or, you know, another right. Batman movie starring Michael Keaton or, you know, like, I guess it's a part of it was nostalgia, but, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to ride off the wave of nostalgia, you got to really bring it. And right. um, Fury Road was just such a, an amazing film. I almost wonder if it was, just extra epic because uh they knew that they would be facing a lot of cynicism yeah. with with an audience like mad max really okay let's let's see what you got and they sure they showed us what they had it's like this is one of the best movies you're gonna see for a while yeah and uh really after i saw it in the theater uh, I, I watched it twice in the theater because I, I loved it the first time around but i had to go pee a couple of times so i wanted to watch it again and to get the full without being interrupted so i didn't drink anything i made yeah. sure i hadn't drank anything in a while i was gonna sit there um the fury road it came out in 2015 was uh the pinnacle of action movie making to me it was just beautiful it was and so crazy insane action for how long was this movie was it oh for two hours just a complete car chase I was from the the very moment the movie started where you get the the lizard scrambling down yeah. and then you get stomped on just from the very moment the voiceover started and the movie started I had a just this goofy idiot grin on my face and yeah. it, I don't think it abated until it was until the movie was over it was just such a fun wild beautiful ride yeah no, it, it, you're right. It, it get, it, I'm getting goosebumps even talking about it right now because I remember <laughs> I remember watching when we we're in the theater and watching it. And like you said, I had a goofy smile. I know I had a goofy smile on my face the entire time I was playing. But what sent me over the edge was the I don't know why this part uh, really appealed to me. Maybe it was the fanaticism, the the uh, the cult like status that the war boys had. But when they're fighting off the crows, I think they're the crows, that other gang. And 
Wurzel gets smacked in the head or in the face <laughs> with all these spikes. And he's like, oh, and he's like, sprays that on his mouth. And he's like, witness me. And everyone's like, everyone's pointing at him and pointing. And he jumps up and you see that slow, it's a slow, cool, quick motion as he commits suicide. And I was just like, fucking metal. Like, oh, yes. dude. Yeah, it was so good. And it, I mean, that I had, I went out, I remember when it first came out on DVD, I immediately bought it and then watched it a million times. Oh, same here. It was uh, just, you know, like a 15 year old boy's uh, notebook in, you know, like the the scribbles in the margin that you write when you're an overly imaginative 15 year old. It was yeah. brought to life. It's just I don't know how that they didn't end up killing a bunch of people. <laughs> Making that right, movie. It yeah. looks, it, it's just, it, all this practical effects. They were really out there on real cars. Real, mm -hmm. There was real fire. People were really pole vaulting between cars. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just total bananas insanity. It's just, um, but that, I, I don't know. It's just, you're just caught up in it. Uh, Tom Hardy was a great Max. He didn't yeah. have a whole lot to say, but that was by design. And he, mm -hmm. his acting really pushed it. The guy uh, has made a career out of acting through uh, face stuff. It's going <laughs> <That's true. laughs> to impede your acting, but um, yeah. Uh, so, so apparently the, this was Fury Road was in the works uh, in the writing stages way back in the nineties. And uh, Matt, uh, they were planning on bringing Gibson, Mel Gibson back for it. Um, things just, you know, with movie making movies just kept falling through and falling through. And I went to see a screening of Mad Max road warrior and Thunderdome at the Egyptian theater in Hollywood. And uh, Mel Gibson came and did a Q and a for that. Wow. And we were up front. We got to see him walk by us. We're like, Oh, there's Mel Gibson. And I was like, and then and he, was, he was talking about making a new movie he didn't call it fury road he was just saying the new mad max movie he's like we're still talking about stuff and, and he goes uh, i don't know if i'm gonna be doing it or something but you know there it, it was it's still being worked on and everyone was like yeah it's great news and you know that was in it was in 2011 20 it had to be tw 2011 or 2012 okay. i think by the, i think that by that point uh gibson already knew he wasn't going to be in it but he didn't want to give too much away obviously um but yeah, everything kind of came to a head, and you know, obviously in 2015 when it was released, and there, there's still so it's still weird that people say, "Oh, uh, it's not Mel Gibson, it's not Mel Gibson." I was like, Mel Gibson is a man in his 70s. Uh, how is he going to do anything that Hardy was doing? No, you got to accept that younger actors need to play some of these parts that these older actors can't play anymore. Uh, yeah, it goes and, back. And it goes back into the Evil Dead thing, the the remake of that when. You know, they will people. not let poor Bruce right sit down for a minute. Yeah, and it's and the fans are they're still they're holding on to this fantasy that we're going to get one more movie with old man Mel in it, and it's you know it it you could maybe make it work. The guy's still a good actor. I mean, whatever yeah. you might think about him <laughs> as a human he's being, a, he's a good actor uh, and a good filmmaker. But yeah, he's a yeah. piece of shit as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just call it what it is. But yeah. um, uh. I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine it and I just, it doesn't work for me even mm -hmm. in my imagination. So I, I don't know. I mean, I thought Tom Hardy did a, a great job and, and yeah. it's weird. I, it didn't even occur to me that Mel Gibson could be considered to be in that role. Yeah. It's like, what, why would you commit elder abuse just to make yeah. your, your movie? I, I think in the early stages of the movie, he was supposed to be brought in as an older figure, maybe kind of doing the same Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull kind of thing where they yeah. bring in a younger guy to do most of the stuff. But um, I, I'm glad they scrapped that and they uh, Miller concentrated on just kind of like a reframing of the universe. Um, it, it's still the same universe, universe but it's uh, the same world but the world building feels so much more rich and nuanced yeah. and there's so in fury road there were so many things like i the, the the crows that's only one gang in the wasteland there's other gangs that lurk out there that we i think we see a couple of them um in, in fury road uh because there's that and then you know the war boys you know and they they have their own language shiny and chrome valhalla they got their symbol yeah. where they're doing this you know and the the almighty V8 is their God. And it, <laughs> yeah. It's such uh, uh, I, I love the world building in it and they don't have to explain shit. 
No, they're just like this is just the, the, these these guys are fanatical. They uh, they spray spray paint in their teeth to, yeah. to, to, <laughs> before they jump to Valhalla. Um, and I forget the the actor's name. Who's the Renfield guy that that was um, in that movie? He was he was good in it too. He, he oh Nicholas Holt. Yeah. Nicholas, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nicholas Holt is amazing. Oh, yeah, that played, uh, Charlize uh, Theron as as yeah. Furiosa in it. It's just there's. You can't if you don't like that movie, then I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't know what's wrong with you and and, and what what you need. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's a, it's an amazing piece of filmmaking. And I still watch it. I still watch it to this day so many times. In fact, it's probably my favorite of the entire series, uh, although I do love the Road Warrior, you know, and Mad Max that Fury Road is just an amped up version of those movies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's a there's a dude on the front of a of a truck playing a flaming you know <laughs> guitar. That's just you know, come on, you know. Yeah. It's, 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 there's not really much you can pontificate about it because it's just like if you like if you don't like it, then it's that's that's not your thing at all. Like, right? Got some allergic reaction to cars and desert. I guess. Yeah. No, it, it's. Uh, I think we. I think there's a lot of people that agree that this the Fury Road is just an amazing action piece that can't be replicated. I think if Miller had access to these tools back when he was filming Road War, he would have done done this with yeah with uh, Mel Gibson back then. But obviously, you know. Well, he said so. He said so himself that yeah. you know, like he's he's been making movies long enough to see these. Um, you know, just these quantum leaps in technology, and we all have, and it kind of makes you it it, it kind of makes you think back and realize just how lucky we were to have seen just these iconic movies because yeah. um, you know a lot of the stuff that's that's come out throughout our lives they've been trying to replicate the magic of that and failing miserably time and mm -hmm. time again with all these subsequent sequels in other uh, in, in other franchises, other franchises, yeah, Max. yeah, yeah. Um, this this one surprisingly has has kept up its momentum. I, I was, which is really cool if you're a fan of the series. I was, right. um, I didn't know exactly what to expect going into Furiosa. I knew I was going to like it. I, I was, I went in, you know, expecting to enjoy it. And um, I, I loved it and I loved it in ways that I didn't expect, which is yes. kind of unheard of with a, a, a prequel because they, just right off the bat, you're dealing with the fact that it's a prequel. It's already got that prequel stank working again. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. And that's, uh, I was, I was telling, uh, I was telling Tina, my wife, uh, I know, you know, just my wife, but, uh, oh, but yeah, I, was, yeah. I, I was, I was telling, telling her after we saw it, that this is how you do a prequel. You don't, yeah. I mean, George Miller knows what he's done. He knows everything that he's done in the previous movies, uh, and especially Fury Road. And he, nothing diverges that would make you think, wait a minute, if this happens here, then how does this happen in Fury Road? Yeah. Nothing makes me think that at all. That he nailed everything, all the little plot points that should be carried over into Fury Road and the little subtleties he does with, uh, the actors he uses the, the, that that return to reprise the roles from Fury Road is is amazing as well. Yeah, I was I was I don't you never play I don't know if you ever played the Mad Max video game that came out in twenty around 2015, 2016. I, I'm very familiar with it, but uh, no, I did not play it. Okay, so it's it's a cool game. You get to wander around the wasteland, having road fights with. Uh, the war boys and other clans uh, in the desert. Um, but the main villain in that, in that video game is Scrotus, the son of Immortan Joe. Oh, so, cool. So the fact that they brought Scrotus in for Furiosa, I was like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? <laughs> and I was, I kept, I kept mentioning. I was it's like, fan yeah. service for five fans. You know? Yeah. For five fans. And I was like, I was like, I was telling her, I was like, he's in the video game. Oh my God. She's and they, like, okay, it, okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there's another little character uh, when Furios is looking for a car, and that weird guy comes out with the plates on him. He says, "Oh, I've got something for you. I've got a car right over here." He was in the game. He's in the goddamn game too. So, damn. Uh, I mean, and uh, you know, and it's I've heard in uh, interviews George Miller, you know, not he didn't go into depth, but he's he's brought up video games how they've you you see a lot of post apocalyptic themes in video games and movies. Yeah. So um now that's well, he, great. 
Yeah, and he also works with comics um, because I do have the Immortan Joe comic. Uh, it's kind of like the prequel and how Immortan Joe got to where he is and how he captured the Citadel from the previous uh, warlords that were there. And it, it all just links up. It's beautifully. Well, Furiosa was originally going to be an anime. Oh, really? It was originally conceived as an anime. And um, just the timing of, of how long it took for them to bring out, uh, you know, a Fury Road kind of messed with the timing of that. And then so yep. years passed and they decided to, to, to make it a live action. But the thing that, that kind of impresses me about it is that you see a lot of, of those same kind of uh, sensibilities on screen in the live action movie that we just saw. Like yeah. it, 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 it could work as it, an anime and it makes sense that it kind of started its life as an anime. It's got a lot of that. Um, all the things that make a really great anime are, are in this movie in some kind of way. Also, you know, anime or, and manga as well, because it's broken down into book chapters. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout. So it's just like, you're seeing one part and go into the next part and the next part. And I, I, I just thought, I, I remember sitting there watching it. I just watched it last night. So it was really kind of fresh. Um, but we, we sat, we were watching for like an hour and then about an hour in, I realized, Hey, uh, isn't Anya Taylor joy supposed to be in this movie? Yeah. And like I, I, I forgot. Oh yeah. She's still a kid for like not half the movie, but an, uh, but a good hour chunk of it. And yeah. the kid looks similar to Anya Taylor Joy and so it, maybe that's why when you see the kid dirty and she's got her head shaved that it it, it it transferred really well to when she gets older you know and I yeah so they, it, they it, used it, a lot of AI slash yeah. face swap stuff when, and I hate using the term AI but that's a whole other thing oh they did that. they did but it's like it, it's a loaded term like you know I'm I, I, I won't go off on a diatribe about it, but the thing that bugs me about it, the fact that AI has been this this term that's been used in in the lexicon is that it's not artificial intelligence. It's <laughs> you're talking about right. like this established idea that AI is the singularity. It's when a, 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 a software becomes so intelligent and so self learning and 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 so self aware that it's gained sentience. That's right. that's AI. So I guess we'll have to come up with another term for that. I guess we'll call it the singularity if we <laughs> if it ever happens. But all these we're talking about aggregate programs and and automation and stuff. So, so that's that's and I don't know a lot about it, but that's yeah. what was used. There was a lot of of you know like computer learning to make her face look de-aged and on this other actor. Oh, so okay. uh, yeah, so and and I think it worked pretty well. It's like it's it's distracting and it's only distracting in the way that you know that that's what they did. Like well, your yeah. brain tells you that they, they that's what they had to do, but it looked really freaking good. I had no idea. I thought they just found a young actor who looked like her, and I was like, wow, she looks really... <laughs> so I had no idea. It wasn't like, um, what is it, Rogue One, where you see uh, Carrie Fisher... Uh, as no, a young they, Leia, where like it's obvious that it, they're it's the yeah same. yeah well and it just shows you just how um just just the huge leaps in technology in such a short amount of time no yeah. I think and and I don't want to I don't want to act like I, I haven't looked into it too too deep but I know that that's what they did and it was done so well that I I was thinking the same thing you were in the sequences by the way spoilers. You know, oh yeah, spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. Um, but uh, like in the scenes when her character was younger, I was thinking the same thing you were. It's like God, they got a young actor that looks just like her. And then the more time went on, the more I was thinking like, no, they would have had to have done some kind of face swap thing um, because just the reason on part of the reason that Anya Taylor Joy is 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 so. Uh, popular right now aside from the fact that she's a phenomenal actor is that she has a look that it just 0.001 percent of humans have she's just right. so unique looking she's got an alien kind of beauty that's just yes. so unique there's no young there's no one else you could get that looks like a young version of her 100%. you know yeah so that's i could tell that they at some point i realized that's has to be what they're doing because i was looking at the lips of the kid like no there's no way that you're like 
<laughs> well, yeah. find somebody else that looks like that. <laughs> so that, that 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 makes a little bit more sense. But I'm glad it it fits sem- seamlessly for me, and I didn't notice it. Um, it would have been I, so I, distracting if it was bad. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's there's so much of the movie is that is her as a kid. Yeah, and I I I I, I wouldn't complain if they used another if they just had another actor, but maybe no. it's because it was the time frame is supposed to be 15 years. So uh, from when they capture, there's a 15 year span of her uh, Furiosa going on these raids and uh, working herself. You know, she's, she avoids the, uh, the pedo, the, the per- <laughs> per- perceived pedophilia. I should <laughs> make that out of, of Rictus, the, the son of Immortan Joe, which I thought they did masterfully because you're sitting there going, Oh, this is fucking gross. Yeah, but they didn't go. They didn't go so far, you know, that it got really more gross. So, they, but you got that hint that oh boy, we have to realize this shit happens and this will happen in the post apocalypse or something. It happens it, now, but it's going to probably be worse in some kind of situation like that. Well, and they and to their credit, I think they did a good job. Like it's they they established that this is a dangerous, horrible world for people, especially for young women. And, you know, like uh, they do establish like a, a Mortis Joe's uh, kind of, what would it be? Like his, his harem, like yeah. his, his harem of breeders, yeah. which is, you know, uh, definitely going to come into play later or before rather when in the other movie that this is a yeah. prequel of. But, uh, you know, one, one thing that I really loved about this movie and, uh, you know, a lot, all of the other movies are fairy tales in their own way, but this one feels the most like a fairy tale to me and i got through it and i i you know i finished watching it and i thought about it for a couple days and i thought like this is this is like you know kind of the um kind of archetypal princess story in the wasteland this is as this is as uh frilly and pink and feminine as you're gonna get in (laughs) in a world like mad max but it it you know, but everything about the movie worked in that direction for me. Yeah. Like it, it was, there was a lot more CGI than yes. the previous movie, but for me it worked because it was, it, it kind of, um, it kind of added to the, to the whole fairy tale theme yeah. of it. And, uh, one of the, one of the big, you know, running themes of this picture is myth and what, really happened versus the story that was told about what happened. And they, they address that head on, Mm -hmm. but what make what kind of makes you think after you've watched it is like, well, maybe the whole movie was fabricated in some kind of way, like even within the context of the story. So the fact that it looked a little bit more, I don't want to say fake, but a little bit more, um, you know, imaginative visually um, kind of, you know, I don't know what the word would be. But. I, I I know what you're trying to say. It, it has a more kind of like um, a fa- fantastical look when, about it. There's, it's a little more visually whimsical than, yeah. than the other movies. But it, it's I like that about it because it's yeah. not Max's story. It's Furiosa's right. story. It's not um, – it, there's still all this grim, gritty, um, you know, oily world of, of the post-apocalypse. But it, 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 it's all the colors are very – lush and and vibrant yeah yeah and the 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 look of the film is i i will say some of the cj cj cgi pulled me out a little bit but yeah. you know it was easily for, forgivable um because like you said you i could tell immediately they're going they're not trying to recreate fury, fury road um there is a different story here you're not going to see one continue there are car chases there is action there is blood there's shooting in the but you know you're going to see there's little moments of reflection and character building that you didn't really see that much in fury road and yeah. i really i really appreciate that uh, tina was telling me she thought she thinks she likes furiosa better than fury road and, i mean uh, and i i respect that in yeah. a way i mean and i think I, that I, that's I, just great yeah, and uh, I could see, you know, she was telling me where she was coming from, you know, you know, just being from the perce- perspective, you know, you know, uh, being a, a, like a not her per se, but she was putting herself in the empathetic place of being a female in that position that you know it, it hit closer to home, and I was like, oh, yeah, shit, yeah I guess it would, yeah. Um, so, well, they did it without. Um, they did it without kind of bending to this to this uh, kind of current Hollywood narrative that's that's 
kind of like I'm so tired of people bitching about it, but I'm also tired of seeing it where it's just this ham fisted uh, like girl power thing. But it, it, it just feels so forced and so um, like just heavy handed that yeah. it, that you, you get kind of you roll your eyes at it. They didn't really do that with this with no. this movie but at the same time it's it's still her story it's still yeah. like uh you know it, it what 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 would it take for you know anybody much less you know like a, a young woman that's gotta pretend to be a man it's, it's certain yeah. yentl like they did the whole yep. thing for <laughs> uh, you know i was like, expecting what, if you're to bust out in song anytime <laughs> <laughs> i thought she did a great job she yeah. she was um she was stoic and silent and uh, you know a, a a fiendish warrior without you know like they didn't have her win arm wrestling contests with 300 pound men right. or, or anything like that that would totally take you out of it i mean there's, there's just, there's just so many beautiful shots um yeah that there's one of her and uh, Anya Taylor Joe ha has that look about her that you know with the the grease smeared across her face and her eyes are just the steel yeah thing that that you know she sells it so goddamn well that you're just like damn she's she's gonna kick some fucking ass and <laughs> there's, there's like a great shot when you know the at um at bullet at the bullet farm where they trap them and they're blowing the, the fire and she kind of steps in between the gate. Yeah. As the fire blows around her, you know, and it's just this amazing shot of her being surrounded by these flames, but protected. Uh, like she <laughs> has this armor that, you know, she can still be hurt and killed, but she's got this mythical um, thing about her. Um, the hero, the mythical hero who can't be killed, you know, that no matter how much you try kind of like Max. <laughs> Yeah. And there was like, you know, we, you, you talked briefly about like, you know, the prequel nature of it. And what I loved about it was like, there were, there were certain things that, you know, there were certain things, you know, we had to get there. Okay. How'd she lose her arm? Uh, you know, we knew that at some point she's going to lose that arm. We knew at some point X, Y, and Z is going to happen, but I loved the way that they got us there. Like, yeah. Even I didn't I didn't see the moment coming. They even kind of play with your expectations where yeah. you'll get injured for a second. You're like, oh, there goes that arm. It's like, <laughs> no, that's not that wasn't the moment. And then when it, it does, does happen, uh, when it does happen, you're like, well, did she chew it off like a fucking coyote? <laughs> like, what happened? Here? What is this all about? But and I, I loved it because by there were certain points in the movie it's like okay if you've gotten if you've gone with it till here you know what we're doing like right. it's, it's we're, we're presenting these ridiculous premises but then i i real like i mentioned before by the time i got to the end of the movie i was like well what what if the whole movie is playing tricks on us what if yeah. her within the context of this fictional world what if everything that we saw is contrived and, and just basically a myth within that. And, a and myth her, whole, within it. her whole story was totally different than this. This is, it's, it's kind right. of like, uh, it's the story that the storyteller would write about themselves in a way. I, I absolutely loved it. You know, I, I mean, I, I, like my girlfriend was not as, as impressed. She enjoyed it, but she said it was a half hour too long. And <laughs> I loved it the more I thought about it. And I told yeah. her it, it's possible that um, I'm enjoying it more than it deserved, but I don't think so. I, I loved Furiosa. I thought it was a yeah. fantastic movie. I, I love, I loved it too. I, I love the little um, Easter eggs they posted throughout. Um, there's that one brief moment. You see a mysterious man standing on a hill with a V8 eating some beans, eating some beans. That, yeah. Uh, that, you know, he's got short hair. You don't see, he doesn't have long hair. So we get the, uh, we get that information that Max, knows about the citadel of course he knows about the citadel yeah. he's, a, he's a wanderer in the wasteland so he probably goes to the citadel or around the area to at least trade or do something or something happened where you know they eventually caught up with him maybe they've been chasing him. but we don't know we don't know uh, what happens and why they were after him in fury road in the first place maybe they just wanted to anyways i'm getting off topic well no, uh, it, was, it was a beautiful cameo because they could have had tom hardy kind of in it in a way to, to that would have been really kind of a uh, fan service but it was this far away shot to where you can barely see him. And yeah. it was just this kind of acknowledgement that, you know, it's a, it's a Mad Max story. It's, 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 he's, well, it's not his story. It's, it's hers. It's, yeah. it's the world is bigger than, than just him. Um, it, I think what, they could have screwed this up in so many ways. And, you know, some, and the, some people criticize it a, a little bit more in ways that I, I actually enjoyed, like with the CGI, for instance. Yeah. But. 
but the the and then I think of the whole series, uh, the series as a whole, maybe like the world as a you know <laughs> the whole the whole series. Um, we look at it, and every one of them are told through a storyteller's perspective. If I'm not mistaken, I think even Mad Max is being told through the eyes of someone else who witnessed Max. Um, I'm not sure, but I know definitely in the Road Warrior, someone else is narrating that story. Yeah. So they're creating this narrative and this history of what they saw and who this Road Warrior was. So we don't know what's true in that story in this fictional world, what's true in that story or what's being exaggerated. Um, the same goes for Thunderdome. There's a narrator in that one as well. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And then uh, in Fury Road, uh, we have the historians. The uh, these are the the people that have the tattoos all over their face. They're kind of like the maesters in Game of Thrones, who are, yeah, who know all this knowledge of the old world. Um, but they're also the history and the storytellers. You see that at the end, I think, of uh, Fury Road, not Fury Road, um, Thunderdome, where okay. you see this person is talking to the children and talking about the world that was and explaining. And so that was like one of the first history tellers. So you see Miss Giddy in Fury Road, who's the woman who's like trying to stop Morton Joe from, you know, she's like, you can't get them. They're gone. You, you. And he pushes this shotgun away from her and drags her along on the ride. She's the one she has writing on her face. So she's in a story and she was there to teach the, the breeders, the, the girls, um, the history of the world. So I like, and then this one is told the same way. Furios is to told from a, a narrator narrated perspective of a storyteller, um, because at the end, uh, we we don't know what, what happened. What happened in the end with her and Dementor? You know who's yeah. Uh, it, it just alludes like no one really knows. Uh, did she shoot him? And it shows all these little vague uh, scenes of what she possibly did, which I loved. Yeah. And, like There's how no, it's it's almost like in the writer's room it's like well how do we end it do we ever shoot him does she <laughs> yeah how, how how did dementis die how did dementis it was dementis <laughs> right not dementor yeah. or whatever okay oh um, yeah, yeah um but uh i i loved i love that ending i i thought it yeah just i did too perfect and then i i sat through most of the credits because they they showed scenes from fury road throughout some yeah. of the credits and i was like Oh yeah, I need to go watch Fury Road now. <laughs> oh, and that, that was my thought too. It's like I need to I need to rewatch that. But I yeah. you know, I think that uh the, the the Mad Max movies are oddly optimistic in a way if I think about it. I think that's like there's all these little things like uh in the in the midst of all this chaos and and heartache and and horror cannibalism and just yeah. human savagery, you know, certain things endure like uh you know, just 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 love between people and, yeah. and the need to protect somebody and and you know there's just there's a lot of nice little moments like that throughout nice little yeah empathy that empathy does still exist you know uh yeah. i i know going a little bit long here but uh that with the praetorian that she she wasn't romantically involved in but you know kind of got a hint that maybe she was um but he took pity on her yeah, he was going to get her out, you know, if he could. And, you know, he had an opportunity to leave her and instead went back. So, right. Yeah. So there's like these human moments of people that you think wouldn't have that kind of empathy between them that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, it, it kind of elevated Furiosa for me uh, a little bit above uh, Fury Road in that in that instance. Um, and then uh, I guess I guess other I'm just trying to think other cool. The the when we see a Morton Joe for the first time, the younger Morton Joe and how he interacts with Dementis. It, it was like a showdown between these hugely powerful warlords. And yeah. I, I took so much satisfaction <laughs> from <laughs> that first encounter, especially I was like, Oh no, you don't come and fuck with the Morton Joe. <laughs> yeah. Like you, yeah, you, you've, you've messed with the wrong one here. Right. It's, yeah. It was, it, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it's, you know, what, what can you say? The, the Mad Max. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that the, that that world endures and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes or, you know, seeing what other things inspire it. I mean, like, yeah. you know, there's already been like so many, like one of the one that stands out for me is the Badlands books, that book series. It's, okay. that was, uh, you know, just, very pulpy but uh the, you know that was a whole other kind of series that yeah that, that was fun it's obviously 
you know, inspired heavily off the Road Warrior. So. Sure. Uh, there is supposed to be uh, Mad Max The Wasteland that has been kind of like rumored around. It's even on IMDb right now. Um, uh, it's going to be a, a Mad Max center. It's going to be a Max centered story. Um, no Furios is going to be in it. I think it's supposed to take place an hour or like a year before Fury Road. Okay. Um, so, but uh, George Miller was kind of harping on like if Furiosa is in that doesn't do that well then he may not even bother which would suck really bad uh because i think we need more of these series and you know i george miller is you know he's getting up in years it's kind of like george R. R. martin where they're like uh, write this fucking book you're gonna die <laughs> uh, quick uh, be inspired but but miller miller uh, he, he's he's older and he said he had a hard time filming fury road that it, it exhausted him and he kind of had a similar experience with Fur furiosa um, but I would love to see maybe a, another innovative filmmaker take up the mantle and maybe put another spin, continue the continue a story. Uh, it could still be a, a Mad Max saga, not necessarily like Furiosa, just other characters and a new video game would be the the nuts, man. I mean, like you great. know, I, more after, comics. Yeah, yeah. Com comics a perfect medium for that kind of thing, and I think yeah. that Furiosa kind of proves that. Um, you can expand the, the world. It doesn't need to necessarily all be about Max. Every, yep. you know, like everybody who's alive in the wasteland has their own story. Yep. So, you know, yeah, I, it's just like the, the star Wars films where they finally started making movies and other things about other people other than, you know, the, the canon from their yeah. films. So, well, that's, that's a whole different topic. Yeah, it's a whole different in, my topic. <laughs> in, in my consideration, they're still jacking that up. But. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. I, but, I I think we can I think everyone I think we're, uh, the ma vast majority of people I know who I've seen online have expounded I I know people who who go to Wasteland weekend and they dress up in, in that culture and they have yeah. a good time and they absolutely love Furiosa of course they do you know and but uh, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was an amazing film. I'm definitely going to go watch it again. I am going to buy it when it comes out on streaming because I don't buy. Sorry for people who are uh, into purist, about, uh, purist, media who, purist, media purist, media <laughs> purist. I, I just don't buy anything on physical media anymore. It's too hard to maneuver and take with you once you move. Or <laughs> so I can't. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, I'm definitely get it. I'll probably watch it uh, probably just as many times as I did for your own. So. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm 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 happy to uh, you know that there's a, a recent movie that's come out that I'm that excited about because it's been yeah. a minute. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, do we have anything else to say about Mad Max in the series? No, no, I think we've pretty much exhausted it. But it's yeah, it's it's worthy of of the hour that we've put into it. Yeah, I yeah. I'm glad we could put some time into it because it is. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's my favorite, one of my favorite series for sure. So definitely, it's, it's great yeah. kind of talking about it and oh uh, absolutely I, I i wasn't sure how we should do should do it i was like oh, we'll break it down by movie but uh i'm glad we didn't <laughs> i'm glad we didn't go through every scene through every film that, that we kind of well to me too because i remember very little about the first one and the third yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> uh but okay so that's about it thank you guys for joining us we'll have some Appreciate more it. content for you soon but this has been a special episode of bits and chunks for mad max and i'm jason I'm Clay. Thank Clay. you for joining us, everybody. Yeah.